Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Um, we're trying to um, take some of the statements that you see in that video and sort of explain them a little bit because um, although there have been things that we've been sort of learning and talking about for a while, it's only when you start thinking about each one that you, you get into sort of the implications. So um, I decided this week I wanted to talk about we are participating in the restoration of all things, which sounds brilliant <laughs> because we are. And then when I sort of thought, what does that mean? I thought all things is quite a big topic to cover. Um, so I'm kind of going to talk about how we're participating in the restoration of all things, but I'm going to have to focus it on... I'm just going to have to focus it, aren't I? Because all things is quite a big topic to cover in a short slot. So I'm sure this one will come up again. But up front, you know, I wanted to sort of make you aware that I was going to focus it for now on what our... Uh, core purposes as a community, not to exclude anyone who doesn't feel part of our community, but to actually make you very aware and communicate clearly who we are, what we're doing, because I think who we are and what we're doing, if we could see it a ripple effect like a stone thrown in a pond, if we can do it here and it can ripple out, I think it could have an impact on wider things. Now, some of the things that I can't get into, but I think you might have some interesting conversations on the back of what I say tonight, and we may well look at it in the lab at some point, uh, is there, impl there are implications in the idea of the restoration of all things as to what our part is to play in things like social justice, in things like politics, in things like how we are responsible for the earth itself, and nature and creation, there are massive implications. If we are going to be a part of the restoration of all things, all is all. So all of that needs to be com covered, but I can't do all of that tonight. Um, but what I wanted to do, and I'm, I'm convinced I can have a shot at, is creating a kind of um, backdrop that we could begin to weigh up um, what some of those things might look like as we walk them out. So I'm going to talk about what I think we're restoring, how I think we're going to restore it, and how we can begin to apply it. But there'll be more to come. Um, now, if our approach, talking about a com our, our authenticity as a community here, if our approach to the wider world, all things, is not filtered through what we have come to believe and understand and express about the God of Jesus, the Father of Jesus, um, then I could kind of argue strongly that we, we're going to begin to have a bit of an, an integrity issue, by which I mean integrated means that it actually is whole, it's undivided. So what I mean by this is if we're starting to say that love is going to win, that has to be something that then is applied across the board for us to be undivided in our approach and whole in our approach. So it can't be right. Well, when I'm, in, when I'm in this building and part of this community, love wins. But when I'm at work, my rights win. And when I'm with my husband, um, my attitude wins. And when I'm over here, the law wins. If we're really going to be it in all things, we have to be it across the board, um, or else we've really got to ask ourselves some questions. Um, and in one of the Psalms, one of the people says, um, asks God to give him an undivided heart. And I think that's a great prayer, because we're all up for it when we're up for it, until the water comes in our boat, and you think, well, I don't want to play it here. I want to be part of the restoration and great good news in all of these bits, but not here. This bit I just want fixing and sorting out and to keep as my own. So I'm hoping tonight that I can show you the trajectory that I think we're on as a community, and I'm hoping I can convince some of you to be excited about it and join us in it. Now, <laughs> um, now what are we restoring? I'm very much going to just jump on the back of what we've been hearing for the last two weeks. Now, Anth two weeks ago talked about the restoration of the law of love. 
the law of love. Not that sort of, it's not wishy-washy, it's not that variable kind of love, dependent on conditions and dependent on how we feel on any given day. But I want to propose, as he did, that it's a love that's very substantial. A love you can, it's a tangible, substantial love because it's actually a love that's the precursor to hope. And that is the confident expectation that there's more to be said. So it's a love that says, do you know what? We're not done with this yet. We're not done with this yet. We're not done with this story. Um, it's also a love that um, we've talked about as well, that it, it leads then to a faith. Now, a faith, is, again, isn't something static and wishy-washy. It's dynamic, like dynamite. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to have an impact on some stuff. It's going to be powerful. And it's going to be an empowering, not something that ends up sort of redundant. And it's going to be a faith that makes substance, not just blows out hot, hair, hot air. So in short, I think that this kind of love we're talking about is a love that has resurrection power. Now just think about the power it takes from something to be dead and then alive. That's a lot of power. That's dynamite power, isn't it? And it does something very raw and very real. And what I believe we're part of in the restoring of all things is restoring that as a way of being and as a way of life. And like the stone in the pond that's going to ripple out. Wow, that's exciting. That's exciting. Um, it's a way of seeing and being that goes beyond what we can physically sense to something much bigger. Um, it's huge. Now, there is evidence, I believe, of this happening all the time in life. And there's also evidence of the opposite to this happening. And human behavior, isn't it hard to stomach sometimes? Isn't watching, not even just watching the news, isn't it just hard living with the people who you live with? It's hard because what we see is how petty, kind, cruel, selfish we can all be sometimes and we get caught up in our stuff and in our viewpoint and instead of that being the spirit out of which we operate that substantial love it just falls by the wayside for all the stuff that we get ourselves embroiled in so we're part of restoring that of keeping that at the fore of what we do at the fore of who we are at the fore of what we're going to express in the earth does that sound good I think so. Okay. Now, the overarching story, as Chris said last week when she had little beautiful baby Jacob up here, is that the message is that you are loved. You're a, a son, meaning also daughters in there as well. It's to do with inheritance. Listen to it last week if you didn't hear it. And also that he is pleased with us. So the message that we are restoring all the time within this love that has resurrection power is that you're loved, whoever you are. You are seen and you are, you are a son and that you are, have a God who looks at you and can be pleased with you. The reason why he can be pleased... Yeah, did I say you, can have, you have a son? You have a father. Didn't mean to shock some of you then. You've not got a long-lost son. Um, now, the fact that it's not conditional means it's not based on the whens, the ifs, or the buts. It's actually just constantly being invested in you. It's not about the small print. Have you ever signed up for something, thought it was a good deal, and then you've realized, oh, I once won a prize and I, uh, for, as a subscription to the gym. And at the time, I thought, that sounds good. So I went to this gym. It was awful. And then the small print was I'd signed up for three years, and I paid a subscription to the gym for three years, and I only went twice. It's not that. It's actually something that does what... It, it's not full of small print. Um, do you know what? That reminds me of something else I'm going to say later, but I can't find where it is. I'll keep going. Um, it's not about the small print, but about the humility. We have to humble ourselves to this, to be defined by something other than what we see as our own successes and our own achievements, and also to define others by beyond what we see of their achievements or their failures, that we're actually going to look at each other through something different other than there's your ticks, there's your crosses, now let me decide what I think of you and of me. It's something way, way, way beyond that. Now, when we get into the blacks and whites of extremes of behavior and the rights and wrongs, um, that's when we end up tripping up over this stuff and we end up with all these additions. And if you've been here for a while, you'd, you've heard that we talk about a new covenant that was established. Not all the old stuff and Jesus added on, 
but there was something very, very, very different going on. And what we're part of restoring is the, the new thing. Not, let's take what everybody else has got and shove a bunch of stuff onto it. Because actually, we want the new stuff. We want the real stuff. I've lost my place. One second. I think, uh, I know why. It's because it's on the back. <laughs> Phew! I was about to be very lost. I was having a bit of an out-of-body experience then. <laughs> it is scary. Okay, it's on the back. It's fine. I'm fine. It's cute. Okay. Now, in summary then, oh, it makes so much more sense now. In summary, restoration is that willingness, is a part of it is that willingness to strip back all the stuff that has been added on as we've walked through life, to get back to a real message. Getting rid of the agendas and the tendency for us to bolt on conditions to see other people and ourselves as worthy. Now, it links to another statement we make, which is that people are precious. We believe here that people are precious. And you know what? The people are precious whether you think that that individual is precious or not they still are. And we tend not to think of people being precious when the people are doing things to, that are different to what we think should be done. So because they're not doing what we think should be done, therefore they're no longer precious. Why? 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 Just because they're not doing it how we would do it. And their differences do not make them less precious, but your differences do not make you less precious because we're precious, end of. We just are. Now, the Galatians in the Bible were a group of people that they started off on their embracing this message of preciousness. And then all of a sudden, things started getting added on again. And all of a sudden, the message became, oh, yeah, well, you're precious, but you better do this, 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 and this, and this. And the guy that set them up on this route wrote to them and basically said, what are you doing? What are you doing? You accepted this as a gift, and now you're trying to earn it and do it in your own strength. And it's this idea that we're going to accept that Jesus is this person that tears the veil, that gets us in through the door because of his grace. Um, and then once you're inside this imaginary door that you've been separated from forever, once you're in there, you better work really hard to stay in there or you'll be booted back out again. How is that good news? That's just sewing up the curtain that has already been destroyed for us. And there is no way into this relationship without grace, but that grace has been given, so there's now no separation. So let's not then take over and add on a bunch of conditions to keep it there. Um, the restoration of all things, the core message is the message with nothing added on. The Father revealed in Jesus plus nothing, plus nothing, nothing. An innate worthiness given and not retracted by how we fall short of our own or of others' expectations. Look at how Jesus treated those he came into contact with if you want evidence that this is the, the way that he established. Think of the people who everybody else has ostracized and disenfranchised for a range of reasons. Other people said they weren't acceptable because they were poor, because they were female, because they were blind, because they were lame, because of the job they did or the lifestyle they led. And he came and said, you know what, you what, you can follow me. You can follow me and you can be with me. That's good news. And what we are part of restoring is shouting that good news loud and proud that if you've been ostracized or disenfranchised from everyone else that you have ever come into contact with in your life, you are not that to the Father and you are not that to this community. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So what does our participating in that mean or look like? Because that's that's words, isn't it? But what do we do with it? Now, to me, what this means is that that has to start to become, and we've heard this before, the lens that we're going to look through in our interactions with people and in everything that we do. If that's going to be what we're part of restoring, that has to be the, the glasses we wear to look and evaluate our approach to all things, all things, not just some things, all things, because we can become creators and are creators and continuers of that. 
Um, to me, this means that what we're saying is that we have pulled up a chair at this table and we're going to stay sitting at it however, <laughs> however tempted we get sometimes. Hey, I'm not sitting here. I'm not sitting here while you're doing that. I'm off. We, sit, we pull up a chair at that table and we determine we're going to stay at that table that is inclusive. Now, it is not an easy path to follow because we tend to resist what we feel uncomfortable with. We don't have to, we just tend to do that. And we tend to live life um, working within the filters and the lenses that we've looked at for many, many years. We all have a list of things that we are more comfortable with, that we think are more acceptable, people that we prefer and find it easier to get on with. We were having a chat yesterday about some people are very compliant by nature, and some people are more rebellious. Now, it's not negative. Neither of those are a negative or a positive. It's just there are people that tend to be like, yeah, whatever, I'll just fit in. I'm one of them. Um, and other people are a bit more like, no, no, I'm, I hear what you're saying, but we need to do it like this. Now, both are equally precious and equally valuable. Both have l things that work really well, and both have things that are real negative. But we, we tend to find people who are like us easier to understand and get on with, or is that just me? I actually quite like some people who are different, um, but we all have that. And they're the people that, you know, when you go to... Um, I don't go to a lot of dinner parties, but you know when you go and sit and have a meal, there's the people that you think, I want to be sat next to you at this table. <laughs> and there's the people that you think, well, I'll come to the meal, but I'm just going to position myself <laughs> down the other end of the table. Because although I sit at the table with them, I'd rather not be with them next to them for the whole night. Oh, please be honest. That's not just me, is it? <laughs> that's not just me. So we're pulling up a chair at this table, but there are some people that we think, I'd rather you were not at this table, or at least not too close to me. It's hard, but, but it's only hard because we have bolted on things rather than seeing a value, like with little baby Jacob that says, you're loved, you're his son, he's pleased with you, so we can just work and walk, um, and, walk and work together. Now, um, we can see and fall into the trap of wanting a restoration sometimes that says we have to put right everything that we see is wrong. So it can come to the part where it's the restoration of all things is about I'm going to work out everything that's broken and I am going to make sure we fix it. But the problem with that is it always comes from a position of lack, of what isn't, of what's wrong and terrible and then we can become the religious police the police that are going to go around and tell everybody what's wrong with the world and how they should fix it and we know best and that's where we get into the people calling you bible bashers and stuff because we're the morality police who are going to put everything right but for me the restoration of all things is this that the good news of what has been finished means that there's not this almighty problem to be fixed. There's just this almighty solution that we can be revealed and that we can outwork. There's a massive solution to the world. So we're not part of fixing a problem because we're going to go bash everyone around the head and tell them what a problem they are. We are part of saying, do you know what? We've got an answer. We've got a way of living and being that's going to transform. Now, when we get into the rights and wrongs, we get in, driven by this almost judicial system that actually comes from this sense in which, you know, we have a superior agenda and we're going to tell everybody what they need to do to put things right. It's an awful spirit to operate in. It's a religious spirit to operate in. And that's not what we're doing in the restoration of all things. Not going around telling everybody else what they've got wrong. We're going around telling them that they are loved, that they are accepted, that they don't have to be disenfranchised from anything that kingdom has to give to them, and we're going to outwork that. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get unsettled in who I am and unsure in who I am, and I try and fix things, I do my worst parenting, my worst wifing, is that a word? My worst teaching, my worst leading, my worst friendship, when I am coming at it, to fix something in me because then I want them to work to my script. <laughs> I want my child to behave a certain way. I want my kids in 
my classroom to behave a certain way. I want my husband to behave a certain way because then that will make me feel and look better about who I am. Again, that's not just me. <laughs> When I am not settled in who I am, and when I don't come at this from the point of view that I am restored to work out of a place where I am loved, I am seen as a son, he is pleased with me. When I operate out of that, I do my relationships out of that, and that outworks it, and ripple effect happens. If I come at stuff with my own agendas, how can I be part of restoring all things? I'm causing chaos. Causing absolute chaos. You should have seen me stay yelling at my child. For I don't often yell at my child. But why do I need to say that if I'm not worried about my reputation? But he put his school trousers in, crumpled up back in his drawer. <gasps> so in my head, it was either, right, either they're dirty and they should be in the dirty clothes basket, or I've washed and ironed them and now I've got to do that again. So we had a moment. <laughs> Mother had a meltdown. Mother had a meltdown. It's all right, isn't it? That's just life. Now, if I come at that from the point of view that, do you know what, it doesn't matter, I'm still going to say something to him. <laughs> I can't help myself. But I don't have to say it in a condemning, aggressive way. I can just be like, hang on a minute, let's make this work between us. Now, what stupid thinking we get into sometimes when we take all of those um, bolt-ons of what it's going to take for us to look a certain way and then we impose them like shackles on the very people that we love we put these expectations on them so that we look a certain way and can be a certain way rather than being centered ourselves to say, no, my worthiness and my preciousness is established because of whose I am, because of where I belong. I belong to you. And then from that, we can work out and start to outwork the restoration of all things. Now, how do we then begin to apply it? Um, so, I've got this verse from Matthew 5. It's taken from the message version. Version. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you, on, you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house, be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Now, I just want to show you the thought I had about how I could make it memorable for you, what I think us being part of the restoration of all things looks like. It's only short, but have a little look at this. It's about a minute, just under two minutes.
They can do this thing now where they can take pictures and they can take movies and they can restore it to colour. And what occurred to me as I was uh, watching it and thinking about it was that um, it looks a little bit like they've, they've moved it from black and white and they've moved it forward to colour. But if you think about it, when it was originally filmed, the people were not in black and white and the grass was not in black and white. It was originally, the people being filmed were in colour, but they didn't have the technology or the understanding at that time to capture it in colour. So it appears to be black and white. But actually now, because of learning and technology moving forward, they can now draw out what it really, close to what it really looked like at the time. So the restoration is getting it back to what it was at the starting point, but what it wasn't able to be because of they didn't have the wherewithal or the ability to do it. Now, to me, this is part of restoration, and it links to that picture. I think being part of the restoration of all things, in a nutshell, is about us being having the potential to add colour. Call it light, if you prefer, but to add colour somehow or other that we can bring out the God colours. There might be things in your life that when you think about they play in black and white in your mind. And it's all about the rights and wrongs of those situations and all about what's happened and what happens and all about the extremes of it. And we've talked a lot about being willing to accept all the diversity of our experience and the diversity of people and make it all, all part of the pot of life and all mean something. The, the restoration of all things to me is the world in colour. The world in colour, not in the blacks and whites and the extremes, but actually saying we can be part of adding colour. Colour to people's lives, somehow or other helping them play back the story, but with hope and with life and with love. And it's somehow part of restoring and redeeming some of those things that might have happened and replaying it as part of the story. And there's nothing like a conversation when everybody just wants to learn and understand and move forward and work together. You can move mountains, but there's also nothing like a story, um, a conversation where someone has got such a fix, fixed mind that they are immovable. And it's that spirit that we want to operate in. We cannot have a version of the story that says, this is my version and I'm sticking to it. Why would we live like that? If there's technology now to put something in colour and capture the truth of what it was at the time, why do we want to leave it in black and white? Why don't we say, brilliant, let's move it forward and let's see it in a new way? Now, um, I've put on, here, on my notes here, be mega teachable be mega teachable. Decide you are going to be willing to learn in everything. Decide that in all the areas of your life, at the minute you're wrestling with the rights and wrongs, that you're going to be willing to humble yourself and let someone apply some colour. And it might not happen that you get the whole picture in colour. It might be one little brush stroke at a time, but believe that colour can come into your life. Now, the other thing that we are not restoring is we are not restoring perfection. We are not restoring perfection. When God made the earth, what did he say it was? He looked and saw that it was good. There was actually a ground where there was nothing there. It actually says there was no man, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent the rain on the earth, there was no one to work the ground. That's not perfect. That's not perfect. What there was was something good with the potential to grow and to flourish. That There was no colour, was there? There's no colour in soil, but what could be planted in the soil was going to be beautiful, radiant flowers that could blossom. Now, if it needs someone to tend it, so part of how we apply it is that will we be part of recreating the wonder of the kingdom in the areas that currently haven't got anything growing? There's, no air, there's nothing growing yet. Will we go out with our seed, our little paintbrush? Will we paint some colour? Will we paint some colour? Those situations you're in with your family or at work or wherever you 
go and interact with during your week? Will you be the person with the brush in the hand, painting colour, because you're not worrying about your own agenda in it all, because you're centred in who you belong to, so you can be part of what adds the colour, not be the one resisting because you're trying to fight for your own position in it all. Um, will I be colour? Will I be salt and light? And will we allow God to send his rain so that that can work the ground and help the process? The other thing that they do sometimes to restore the photos and the films is if it's faded or dulled. And some of you might feel a little bit like your life's just got a bit flat. It's like you feel like you're living life in black and white. Um, and again, I absolutely believe that as part of the restoration that you can connect with, that some colour can start to be added, some purpose, some life, some hope. So how do we apply it? I apply it. I think we've got to do it daily, like medicine. Every morning we get up and we say, I'm going to pick up this brush or whatever analogy you want to use, and I'm going to paint some colour. I'm going to paint some colour because I believe that we are part of the restoration of all things. So... The last thing I wrote on as an additional thought was this. It's going to sound mad, but I put, will it work? Will I actually see results if I live this way? Um, well, that's faith, isn't it? That's, that's faith. Because that's faith. It's a walk of faith. It's a walk of love. Um, and I think that that is also an image I want you to have. Maybe, maybe not straight away with every area, but I do believe it will work because I do believe it's a walk of faith and that we're empowered. So, I'm finished. But I want to ask you, if you want to be part, even if you've not understood everything I've said today, I hope something has, something has resonated with you and I hope that you want to be part of a restoring of all things. Who, who would like to be? Um, and as we, sing this as we sing this last song, it's your opportunity to connect. Are we still doing that one? Um, because there's a line in it that says, through us, it will be shown. And so if it's going to be shown through us, um, we need to be okay with who we are in our own skin because we get who our source is. And then we need to be willing to go paint some colour. And as we do that, the ripples will go out. Um, should we just pray before we sing? Um, okay, God, I want to thank you that you empower us with a dynamic love, hope, and faith to add color to our world. And for everyone in here tonight who has areas in their life where they just feel like the, the movie's playing in black and white, I just speak an experience now that will give them wisdom and insight into how to paint some color. I speak hope and life and confidence in that situation that the last word has not yet been spoken and that each one of us in here can be part of the restoring of all things. So give us a paintbrush with a massive colour palette in our hands tonight, Lord, and just show us, show us where we can add colour and be light. And thank you that the backdrop to all of this is that we are loved, you are pleased with us, and we don't have to add on a load of conditions to be worthy. Thank you for the preciousness that you have given to each one of us. And we won't sew back up the curtain, but we will live, we will live free and we will be part of the restoring of all things and keep giving us wisdom as to how we can do that in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Bless everyone here tonight, Lord, and thank you for your kindness and goodness to us. Amen. Awesome. Um, I must admit, when um, I hear the phrase, the restoration of all things, there's something happens in me and I go quite to a negative place because I think of things like bacteria that, you know, I, it, it's a long time ago that somebody said, you know, that gets into children's eyes and makes them blind, you know, little worms. And you think, how can, how can we resolve that? Because in essence, they have a reason to be but if put in the wrong place, they then create death. And that's not good. But in their own selves, they've probably got a purpose to be. It's just when you mix the two elements together. 
And, and I, when I think of restoration, I, I want there to be no fighting. I want there to be no little children that are orphaned. I don't want to see mothers absolutely screaming their eyes out because the little children have been killed. I don't want any of that. And you think to yourself, well, how can we here in York do anything about that over there? Isn't, I, I, I hope you're with me. Because when we make a statement that we are participating in the, the restoration of all things, we've got to think bigger than here. However, I'm going to bring it back to here. Unless we start here, We'll never do anything further out. And in all honesty, most of us struggle just doing, like I said last week, about knowing what to do in the context of um, being unconditionally loving, being at peace. We struggle with that even in this, don't we? And then we want to change the world. A guy last week was telling me how he'd got an idea to change the world. And what was amazing was he'd written it in four full, uh, full scat pieces of paper. And it was funny, Jenny said, wow, four pieces of paper and you've got an idea to change the world. That's awesome, isn't it? Four pieces of paper. I'll tell you what, it'll take more than four pieces of paper. But I'll tell you what is really the truth for us all. If we would tend our own part of the garden that is my life and be responsible for, for my bit, then at least we can say, I have participated in the restoration of this. And then we trust like the ripples, it moves on and touches others, yeah? Isn't that, I think that that's all we can do. And then, like when Jenny said about, there wasn't a man, therefore there was no shrubs. But once God had got a man sorted to be the tender of the garden, he added the rain, so together, there could be some change and some growth. And so all I want to say to us all tonight, let's be prepared to first of all be willing to do what we need to do in our own lives, in our own um, circles. That's what it is, isn't it? The circle that we're in, circumstance, and then just see how we can be involved in the ripple effects on others. Are you with me? Because I do believe we've participated in the restoration of all things. I'm sent back a, a message to say that whatever happens in Salt Lake, he says, we've already had an incredible impact. He was talking to a guy who was a Mormon for like 60 odd years and he was talking to him for hours the other day and this guy was just drinking, drinking in the incredible uh, Good news of the gospel, and it was amazing. He says, it doesn't matter what else happens now. He says, it's just been amazing, because we are actually helping in the restoration of things. So anyway, we're going to sing this song. We're going to sing Our Father. It's a, a prayer, isn't it? Let's sing it together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Do you know, if... if if we could just all get on board with that, then I'm sure things would change much quicker. But it's mostly, it's our will, isn't it? It's my will. Oh no, my will be done. My kingdom, my, my space, my desires. But if we'd only say no, come on, let's, let's God's king, kingdom come. The Father's kingdom come and his will be done. And then like Jenny said at the end, we're going to sing through us, it will be shown. Let's at least commit in our sphere of rule, our sphere of influence. Let's participate in the restoration, shall we? And if we're at least honourable in that, I'm sure that we'll find that we have access to other things, yeah? So come on, stand up and we'll sing this together and then your release will have d be done and uh, we'll sing this as a prayer, yeah?
Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.